So I'm going to move now in to um, invite our wonderful panelists to introduce themselves. Um, we've got six of those to introduce first. They're all coming onto the screen. Thank you. This bit is working great. Very pleased about that. Um, and I think to make it easy for them, I'm just going to um, ask you in turn to introduce yourself. So if I come to Vivian first and I'll go through the others. Vivian. Sure. Good morning or, or good afternoon. Um, my name is Vivian Lewis and I have the great honour of being uh, the university librarian at McMaster, uh, which is a research intensive university in Hamilton, Canada. And in my spare time, I also am the vice president, president elect of CARL, uh, the Canadian Association of Research Libraries, which is the voice of the 29 largest research libraries and two national libraries in Canada. I will say that Canada is a vast country and so our experiences are quite varied. And for this reason, I can offer you a great buffet uh, of uh, experiences with a distinctly Canadian flavor. I'm suggesting rugged adventure, tasty advice with a good helping of collaboration. I also had the great honor of, of speaking at the Recover, Retrench and Retreat event in June. And so I'm very excited to be able to share in this new feast uh, with you today. That's lovely. Thank you so much, Vivian. Robin, people will know you, but you're next on my screen. Come in. Thanks, Jess. Hello, everyone. I'm <clears throat> Robin Green. I'm librarian at the University of Warwick. And until uh, a short time ago, um, uh, I was chair of RL UK. Um, um, and just taken over from me. So um, RL UK, Research Libraries UK, it's our conference. Uh, and so I'm sure you're aware of who and what we are, but just to make sure we're a consortium of 37 of the leading research libraries in the UK and Ireland. And that's including the National Libraries and the Library of the Wellcome Trust. And uh, uh, we represent the collective voice of our members advocating on their behalf. Um, and we're currently leading an Arts and Humanities Research Council funded study on the role of academic and research libraries as participants and leaders in scholarly research. And there's a survey on this topic is op which is open to 21st of March. And if you want to participate, you can access via the RL UK website. Sorry, I couldn't resist the plug. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely right, Robin. John. Good morning, everyone. My name is John Colshaw. Uh, I am the Jack B. King University Librarian at the University of Iowa. I'm located in Iowa City, Iowa, which is in the center of the United States, uh, about four hours by car from Chicago to give you a little bit of perspective. Uh, I also have the privilege to serve as the president, the current president of the Association of Research Libraries, ARL. Uh, ARL is a group of 125 <laughs> Uh, research libraries in the United States and Canada. Uh, our members, uh, much like Robin suggested for RLUK, uh, we have most of the, R, the R1, the, the larger research institutions, along with some of our government libraries and uh, some specialized research libraries uh, in the US. Uh, we work together on, on issues of importance to all of our members. And uh, given uh, things that are going on in the US, and, and elsewhere in the world these days, we have a, a very deep focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and, uh, and, and working to um, improve social justice for, for our BIPOC uh, colleagues, uh, both in, in our association and in our library. So glad to be here today. Thank you so much, John. And uh, John is at one end of the day, and Jill is at another. Jill, welcome. Uh, Kaya, uh, hello. Uh, so my name is Jill Ben, uh, and uh, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the Wajak Noongar Buja, the, the lands of the Wajak Noongar people, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, as is custom here in Australia. So I'm the university librarian at the University of Western Australia, which is located on the west coast um, of Australia. Uh, and uh, I'm also the current chair of the Council of Australian University Librarians, uh, which similar to the other associations here is, is the peak body uh, for all of the university libraries in Australia. So our members are the 39 university librarians or, or, or equivalent uh, of our universities. And uh, I just wanted to say how tremendous it, it is to, to be here. 
uh, pre-COVID, we probably wouldn't have thought about having this, this type of event. So uh, thank you to RRL UK, and I think we're, we're in for a really interesting event. Thank you so much, Jill. And last but not least, Astrid. Thank you, Jess. So my name is Astrid Verheusen, and I'm the Executive Director of LIBER, the European Association of Research Libraries. Uh, I'm representing 450 libraries, research libraries from more than 40 countries across Europe. Uh, the LIMAR community is a very active one. We participate in lots of European projects and we have 150 volunteers, uh, mem members working in 11 working groups. All of these groups work mostly on topics related to open science. Uh, for this session this afternoon, I will dwell on the results of a survey that LIBER conducted at the end of last year on the impact of COVID-19 on research libraries across Europe. Thank you so much, Astrid. So just before we kind of go in, just a reminder of the kind of rules of engagement, because we really do want participation. So we're going to go into our first question in a minute. We've got three question areas, although, you know, it will expand, I'm sure, beyond that um, with the interests of the audience as well. And really from now on, um, anybody can raise their hand and, you know, in the order in which you appear, our colleagues behind the scenes will invite you into the table. And our question areas, just so you've got a chance to think ahead, we'll be looking at experiences, our takeaways from experience of COVID-19, expectations, what are the impacts and the legacies that we will be taking from this time, and opportunities which we'll close on in terms of working together internationally as a community. And although we are all acknowledging that we're a year into this pandemic and, and the dreadful impact it has had in so many ways on, on the lives of those we love and the communities in which we live, we have made a decision, and I hope people will support this, to spend a, the first 10 minutes or so on that experiences and then be moving forward into thinking about, you know, where next, where does this take us? Um, and that, uh, but we want to pay tribute to begin with to those experiences. And that's right and proper as we all go through this kind of one year anniversary uh, or thereabouts in, in our nation. So, um, so um, it's great to see everybody. And I'm gonna take us into our first question, uh, which is about how would you summarize how would you summarize your institution or your members' experience of COVID-19? And what really sticks out to you and stays with you at this time as one of the key overarching takeaways from this last year? As we get more people around the table, we'll flow uh, and do raise a hand if you want to come in. But I'm gonna come first, if I may, to Astrid and ask her to reflect on that topic, Astrid. Thank you, Jess. So, um, as I said, we, we conducted a survey uh, at the end of last, last year. Um, uh, we had replies from more than 300 research libraries across Europe. Um, also, that meant that there's extreme diversity in, in answers on this survey. But to, to we asked actually two questions, two main questions. One was about the main concerns libraries had at October last year. And the other question we asked what uh, people expected to be the main concern in March, 2021. So actually right now. Um, the main concerns in, in October last year were actually four. Uh, first of all, health and safety of staff was a top concern for uh, back then in October. Second main co concern was the reorganization of libraries. So how to balance between physical spaces and digital infrastructures. That took a, a prominent place in the mind of participants. Uh, third one was dialogue. Dialogue was considered as especially important. Uh, respondents wished to know how their peers were coping. Uh, what are other libraries doing to deal with the situations and what measures have been put in place. Also, 40% of the participants were afraid for, for budget cuts. Um, so then asking them back then in October, uh, what would be a high priority if looking ahead to March 2021? 20, so actually now. First one, also four topics uh, were, were considered as, as high priority. So the first one was redefining services uh, that was high on the agenda of a majority of the libraries and digitization was on everybody's mind. Then there was a focus uh, on increased online training and on digital skills. 
open was considered as the way forward. There was a lot of uh, there were a lot of comments about open access, open science, and open education, and there were discussions on the hybrid forms of future education as well as libraries. Um, people considered the combination of digital and physical libraries uh, that are the future. So I think that summarizes the, the main outcomes of, of the, the survey Liber conducted. Thank you, Astrid. Um, I mean, this is going to be a sobering little bit, I think, of our discussion as we reflect on those experiences and, and just how rapid those changes were for everybody and for our teams and whether you're leading them or trying to make things happen in your teams. Um, you know, the uncertainty and the speed was, was actually, you know, terrifying um, at times. Robin, from, from the UK side, what's your, what's your takeaway from this time? Uh, uh, thanks, Jess. Well, I, I would absolutely echo um, the Libra survey, uh, very much the same as in the UK. Um, I, I, I would say that, that um, uh, what's emerged through the year has, has started off as major concern, and I, my perception is that it's now seen as opportunity. Uh, and that's been a real shift um, and an acceleration of thinking. I, I, if I can, I'm not going to replicate with that Astrid's um, uh, comments, but I'll just give some takeaways, which I think um, are quite important. Um, firstly, our people, the huge commitment everyone made and that they had to the library service. It's astonishing how people adapted as best they could to some of the fundamental shocks that, that we had. And also the changes, um, it will be the same globally. Working from home, people just hadn't really done it before. And it was a massive problem fighting for bandwidth with the rest of your family, uh, with schools being at home, furniture, equipment, and so on. And I think we've got through that. But it, for the messages for the future, are if we stay in this blended environment, then how we need to make sure that works properly. Secondly, and, and really important um, for me, um, I, uh, and our UK members, um, the loss of the collective collection for the first time, it was such a major issue. In do documents about interlibrary loan just shut down and with physical closure of libraries and coupled with travel restrictions that had a massive impact, particularly on some disciplines. Uh, and, and we've seen that through the year and a lot of discussion and some really good initiatives have come out of that. But um, I, I think ever since the recognition that no single library could provide everything, we've relied on each other to meet the needs of our respective communities. And the loss of this has made me rise, realize just how important and fragile that collective is, and that we need to find ways to protect it in future. Um, <clears throat> I would say a couple of other points. Um, long, for me, long COVID is emerging as an issue. And I don't mean the health aspects, but libraries are typically what I would describe as professional families with a strong sense of shared service and purpose, almost a mission, as well as a community uh, amongst their staff at all levels. So the library and the parent organization are more than just an employer. Remote working, I think, is breaking this down or will break this down. And it might create divisions, for example, attitudes between those who can work from home and those who can't or who have the blended. For longer standing staff, the relationships are there and harder to break. But how do new staff become part of the community? And what, what will the community be like in the future? And then uh, uh, second, second point in this is really is how to manage and lead at, at all sorts of levels throughout the organization in a blended or remote model to retain that cohesion of being more than just an employer. Thank you, Robin, that's um, really powerful. Uh, there's a comment in the chat from Laura Daniels. I'm sorry, Laura, I'm not sure which institution you're from, but um, she observes that uh, loss immeasurable 
uh, in terms of the intangible benefit from the in-person spontaneous interaction, which I think Robin and Astrid are both alluding to. And, and that spark that occurs when we come together uh, that does not translate to virtual interactions. Um, I, I would like to give a welcome to Michelle Blake from York. Great to have you around the table and also Kirsty Langstad from Edinburgh. I won't always know people are coming to the table, so, um, but in this case I do, so it's great to have you here. Um, just before we move on to the next question, um, uh, John, Jill, Michelle or, uh, or Kirsty, do put up your hand if you'd like to add anything at this stage. Michelle, and I'll come to John. I was just going to talk um, uh, about the importance of, of culture within the organisation to have got through um, the pandemic as well. And obviously we're still going uh, through it. So it's not like it's finished. Um, but I think it, what I've reflected on over the last year is actually, I think the reason that we got through it in, in such a positive way at York is because of our culture. So that is very much around high challenge, high support and that well-being piece. So treating people as individuals and not just as some, you know, staff that come in and do stuff for you and actually taking the time to understand their circumstances and what was happening for them. Um, and, and that obviously um, continues on, but I think um, that that culture that we've set up at York, and I know others will be similar as well in terms of how they've done that, but I think it also allowed us for um, to experiment and innovate during this time as well um, in a way that maybe hasn't been possible before. Um, you know, not with the same restrictions that we've had, we've had to be a lot more creative. And I think the, the other thing that I would say at York, where I think um, has been really helpful has been quite pragmatic about everything. So actually we've had to make really pragmatic decisions about how we're going to operate, what we're going to do. Um, and I think that has meant that we've been able to reopen a lot. Well, we were able to open a lot quicker than a lot of places, including access to our physical collections as well. Um, so taking being risk aware rather than risk averse. Um, and then the, the other thing uh, I want to say, which you might come on to Jess, but um, I think for us, it's been a real opportunity to show the university the importance of the library um, and how at the heart of everything we are. So actually positioning ourselves into, uh, you know, on many kind of areas into a leadership position for the university. And that for me has been really exciting. Here, here, John, come straight in. So I, I just wanted to um, comment for a minute about really the broad divergence and the huge diversity of styles we've seen across our libraries uh, in our association. Um, it's interesting to me, you know, because we're we're just about one year from the time we were all shutting down. And and when when the libraries in the US and Canada were shutting down, ARL was making an effort to track in a spreadsheet who had shut down, you know, what did this mean? Because some of our members needed support. To, to go to their administration and say, well, look, libraries here are doing this. We really have to do this, whereas others were leaders. So I just think the, you know, looking at the differences in approaches and responses over the course of this entire year has, has really been uh, quite amazing. And uh, whether, it's, whether it's, you know, rural, uh, you know, libraries that are in smaller communities like my own compared to large libraries in, in, in enormous urban areas uh, in, in the US in particular, the politics uh, have really played into this uh, to, to, to an enormous uh, regard and then public versus private. So just the differences are, are quite shocking. And I think personally, at least I have tried to maintain flexibility through the entire uh, the, the entire pandemic era. And I, at the, at the beginning of this, when I was communicating with the library staff, um, I saw a blog post by Dieta Jones uh, about the four C's related to communication. And the four C's were clarity, consistency, care, and continuity. And that was something that I tried to, to reiterate. And I think all of my colleagues throughout ARL really tried to reiterate as leaders, tying into what Robin said, where, where we really had to step up and become leaders in a brand new way in this era. So that's part of the experience for me. 
John, I'm sure there are many people in this call who will recognise that. And I think those those three C's are, are uh, takeaways now and for this time, but also for the future, which we're going to move on to in a moment. I just wanted to recognise the comments in the chat, a lot of um, shout outs for the kind of uh, the emphasis on well-being at this time. I think we'll probably hear more of that, um, thinking of, of Robin's reference to long COVID, the mental health legacies and so on through this uh, as we go further to the talk. I know that we could talk about the um, felt experience um, and the changes that have gone through um, for the whole of this session. And in many ways, that would be very cathartic. Uh, but I'm going to shift us on slightly um, to be thinking beyond this moment. And the second area of kind of thematic question is really, what do you expect the legacy to be? Whether that's for your own institution, uh, which we'll all learn from, or indeed as a member organisation, what's coming through as a group. And again, if I can just, you know, remind audience members, we would love to have you at this table. There's an extra chair that's free if anyone wants to come in now. Um, equally, you know, you, you participate by listening and enjoying, but it, it really is not meant to be terrifying. See, Michelle has just spoken, it's fantastic, it's informal. Um, but to kick us off, I'm going to come to um, Jill, if I may, first, and then to John. So perhaps Jill will speak and then John come in naturally. We'll see who else wants to join us as we go through. Jill. Thanks, Jess. So um, we've been really fortunate in Australia because we, we haven't really had the same severe health crisis um, as other parts of the world. And I'm honestly in awe of, of what libraries have done uh, globally and, and especially uh, where, where all of you are. Um, but the financial impact in Australia has just been uh, extremely acute. Uh, so our, our international borders have been closed for 12 months. Uh, none of our international students could come semester one last year or semester two, and again, semester one this year. So we are really struggling. Uh, our whole sector is struggling right now. Uh, and, you know, in terms of a lasting legacy uh, of that, there's lots of implications both for our institutions and our associations. And I, and I, I don't want to sound negative and, and make this a, a bit of a, you know, a negative list, but I, some of the things that I think are happening now are going to have a long uh, legacy. And they're, they're things like, you know, really significant restructuring and downsizing uh, of all university staff, in, in, including libraries. You know, we've got much leaner libraries than we've had before. Um, some services are ceasing or significantly reducing. And I think some of our really high value specialist services that we deliver to, you know, a small number of clients are really at risk. And, and so we're really going to have to advocate hard uh, for some of those services or, or indeed maybe transition to do them differently. And so that digitalization, automation, the centralization that we saw uh, during COVID, during that rapid uh, innovation period, I think we're really going to have to use, use that same innovation uh, to face this, this next challenge. I think too, one of the things we're seeing is that our members are, are, are focusing a little bit more inwards than they have before, you know, into their organisation. And I think this is a result of that, that financial uh, pressure that they're experiencing at their institutions. And as uh, national associations, I think it's really important that we keep our, our members engaged and we might need to think about new ways uh, to do that. Um, the other thing I might, I thought I might quickly just touch on uh, is the physical spaces, because I, I guess here in Australia, we've sort of come out uh, the other side of, of recovery and we're operating with very little restrictions where, where I am, am now. And my biggest fear when we went into lockdown initially was that no one would ever come back to the library. I can remember that very emotional moment of closing the door and and thinking, oh my God, nobody is ever going to return. And sure, you know, semester two last year, our numbers were, were pretty down, 40% down than, than the usual uh, numbers that we would see in our libraries. But I'm really pleased to report we're about 90% back uh, to what we had pre-COVID. You know, uh, last week we had 70,000 visits uh, to our libraries on campus. On Tuesday this week, you know, we had, you know, 15,000 visits. Sure, it was 35 degrees, so everyone likes the air conditioning, but, you know, to see those students so enthusiastically re-embracing being together. And, you know, so much of our curriculum is still delivered online, but the students are demanding that physical contact and interaction. And the library is really seen uh, as the place for us. And I can see a future where there's a lot more online teaching being delivered, but people really coming onto campus and they come into the library. So I, I really do see a bright future ahead uh, for our physical spaces. 
Thanks so much, Jill. Um, that kind of clamour to get back into the buildings, we have experienced that, and I'm sure that will resonate with many as well. Um, although the idea of 70,000 visits uh, currently sounds pretty terrifying from, from where we are in, in our progress out of the pandemic, but, you know, fantastically you're there. John, how does that compare to things where you are? Well, I, you know, we, we have uh, reopened at my institution. Our numbers are still fairly low, um, but that, that's, um, that's really by design, I would say, uh, to continue to keep people safe. So I, I think in our institutions, we worry about how we're going to bring people back. Um, I, you know, I, I do think that um, one of the successes for libraries is uh, during the pandemic, we were able to demonstrate that we are critical research partners to our institutions. And um, we were also critical um, partners in the delivery of remote learning. And, uh, you know, libraries were ready for this. You know, we, we had things to do, um, but we were able to turn on a dime and quickly adapt to the new online learning environment. And librarians, uh, liaison librarians and others were ready to go in terms of bringing uh, value to the online curriculum early in those pandemic days. And I, I don't think that will be forgotten um, on, on our campuses going forward, which is really very important. I think one of the big issues for, for our, our libraries in, uh, in across ARL, as we think about um, how we come out of this experience is going to be equity. And um, the hybrid relationship is gonna be there. Uh, you know, we're all gonna have this hybrid future, but who are the individuals gonna be that are coming back to campus? And is it gonna be equitable across all our employees? Or is it going to be the uh, folks who are sitting at service desks or just our custodians or you name it? Uh, and how are we going to balance that and make sure that that everyone has a stake in our in-person future uh, going forward? So I, I would say that the same is true for ARL as an association. I, I think uh, there's an expectation that we're going to have some sort of hybrid future going on. You know, we, throughout the pandemic, we hosted what we called peer-to-peer -peer confabs. Uh, so these were director only conversations uh, that, that happened. They, you know, they kind of spun up on quick topics. I think things like that will continue to be valuable to us. And what will our meetings look like? You know, we now haven't met in person since the fall of 2019. And uh, how are we going to craft these in-person meetings going forward? Um, how do we maintain community? And how do, we bring, how do we bring new leaders into the mix? Just think of the amount of transitions that have happened already uh, across our association in terms of bringing those new leaders in and uh, getting them accustomed to, uh, to working in our community. And then finally, uh, because I see some hands coming up, I'll, I'll just say that um, the budget challenges, the budget changes, I think are also a big issue uh, in our libraries. Absolutely, we all know about that. But from the perspective of an association, a membership association, we do have concerns about the ability of our members to, to continue their membership. And we, we wanna make sure that we continue to deliver uh, services and programs that are of the top value so that memberships will be uh, maintained. Thank you so much, John. Uh, um, I'm going to come to Kirsty uh, next week because she's put her hand up kind of virtually in the chat. So I'm going to come to Kirsty, then I'll come to you. Before I just bring Kirsty in, uh, Liz Waller and uh, Wendy White both making great comments about innovation. Uh, if any of them want to come into the room and make these comments in person, then please, please do. Kirsty. Yes, I think what's been really interesting and what a number of speakers have touched on is just the change of the role of the library within the university and that recognition how essential the services and what we do is to the university. I think from our perspective, what was really interesting was that the library became one of the research laboratories and was designated as such within Edinburgh in order to allow our sort of special collections and the Centre for Research Collections to open up early to provide humanities researchers with that equitable access, which was happening across in the sort of sciences and medicine and veterinary studies. So I think that's been a really chain, big change for us and how we are seen and seen within that wider kind of community. 
I think that's also interestingly brought some some interesting pressures for us, which our staff have sort of struggled and grappled with at times. It's that trying to provide really essential services that the community is looking for, as well as that sort of well-being piece for our sort of staff and getting that balance right. Um, hasn't always been easy and, and they've sort of pushed, pulled and tugged against each other. And again, we've really noticed, as others have mentioned, that change in attitude to staff, how they've been able to respond. I think, you know, we've spun up several new services when in the past we might have brought one new service along every couple of years. So that change in mindset has really demonstrated itself. And I think that's one of the things we're going to need to be resilient and be able to continue for the future. Thank you so much, Kirsty. There's such a lot in there. And um, I'm gonna bring in Vivian uh, and then Liz. Uh, and I would be surprised if that kind of question of momentum around innovation doesn't come up um, as we go through, Vivian. I first wanna just cheer Kirsty on because I agree completely. And I was thinking the other day in some, some ways, I think we are the victims of our own success. Um, I had a dean say to me the other day, librarians appear to have superpowers that I didn't know of until the pandemic began. Um, you know, I'm, in Canada, I will, will say, you know, we are um, uh, sort of, uh, many of us are still very, very much in a lockdown position. Uh, there, are no, there are no students in, in my library, and that's the case in, in many parts of Canada. We are, we are not there. We are thinking about how we might be able to reopen in September. I just wanted to reflect quickly on the collection piece because it's an area where I see uh, that we have invested a huge amount of our budget in uh, streaming video and electronic books to try and get more content in the hands of our researchers wherever they are in the world because they've all dispersed. Um, and people love it. And I'm starting to receive these requests. Well, after the pandemic is over, can we keep all of those things? Um, you know, in many, many places in Canada, we negotiated a re, uh, agreements with the Hadi Trust to provide electronic access to huge um, portions of our print collection while we remain closed. And I'm receiving messages now from deans saying, can we keep that after the pandemic is over? And so we're going to reach this budgetary issue where people love some of the new things that we've introduced to support them through the pandemic. They're still grieving the loss of some other things, but they want to keep everything that 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 we've bought for them. Um, I also wanted just to reflect very quickly on what I what I think of as the institutional value um, proposition that we have changed dramatically. Uh, I believe and I, I hear this from my colleagues across Canada that we have found new credibility uh, and uh, a new sense of influence at the Dean's table that we frankly did not have before this began. We sometimes said that we have the kittens and puppies uh, branding issue that everyone loves the library in the same way that they love kittens and puppies and slippers by the fire. But that's not a great image when you're trying to work through a pandemic. But I think what we've dis um, displayed is this, this incredible set of superpowers. It's our ability to be quite tech savvy in a way that no one imagined. The ability to spin up what people believe are very, very complex new programs, which we chuckle at because we can spin them up in a day. Um, and a bit of fearlessness that no one realized that we had, including in some cases ourselves. Uh, and also this other secret sauce, which is the fact that libraries tend to be fully committed to the university's overall research um, mission. We're not just in it to, to um, afford the library, we're really in it for our students and for the campus as a whole. And so I reflect, and I'm closing off here, around our RLUK's whole um, messaging around the need to be trusted um, within our own organizations to work outside of our traditional professional boundaries. And I think that is going to be the lasting legacy of the pandemic. Vivian, that was tremendous. Um, uh, and I'm uh, now musing on superpowers and secret source uh, and all other metaphors that kind of work in our favor in terms of advocacy. Thank you so much. I'm um, gonna suggest actually, Robin, if I don't mind if I can come to Liz, uh, who made some great comments about innovation in, and it'd be great, Liz, to sort of pick up that if you're willing to, and then I'll come to Robin. Sure, thanks, uh, thanks, Jess. I just wanted to very quickly mention kittens and puppies, actually, because I think that's a brilliant phrase uh, for libraries. 
and, and just reflect on a comment that we had from an academic because we we were fairly early on in, in regaining on campus activity and opening the library um, at least to, to our research community and she commented that knowing the library was going to physically open give gave her hope that actually we would return to normality. And I think in a way we've kind of, I hope, we've moved slightly away from that kitten and puppy to being something that is absolutely recognized as being core to the academic activity on campus. And I think also for the first time, our, our VC has been happy to say the library has never closed because of our virtual library presence, which has been in a way a great gain. Um, the comment I made in chat was particularly around the, the importance of the physical experience um, and study space, particularly, I think, for our students and how important that has been to them. Uh, and we've managed to keep study space going since August whew, um, without falling over. Um, but I think that that desire to be physically together in a library space will continue. It's a space that has absolute clarity of purpose for our students. That's where they want to go to study on campus, to be together, to be apart, to be within a distance of each other, but still operating independently. But I think what it's going to give us now is because of the, I think the shift in pedagogy that's really going to pick up pace now, it gives us the opportunity to look at our space and say, well, where are we going next? It's not just about what we're doing now. It's about where, where are we moving to next and driving our spaces and driving the pedagogy around that. So I don't think we should be passive recipients and wait to see where pedagogy is going to take the university, et cetera. I think as librarians, as experts in, in learning and research, experts in space usage, knowing our users, there's a real chance to help drive the pedagogy as well. So I'm really interested in how we do that over the next few months and I think we can't start too soon and um, we have to make the most of this disruption. Thank you so much uh, Liz there is some um, fantastic comments that are coming up through chat I'm going to come to Robin next uh, but also just to let people know um, that after we've had our final question you know, we are going to move to those audience suggestions. So if we're not picking up on points you read in chat now, we're going to come back to some of those in that kind of final, apparently the final dinner course. Uh, so we'll come back to that then. Uh, Robin. I think I'll build slightly on Liz's comments, but also referring back to what Kirsty's presentation this morning, she was talking about risk. And I've got a question for all of us, I think. Um, given what we're talking about innovation, about spinning up services quickly, about changing, about being radical, uh, has our approach to risk changed uh, as a result of this year? Has yours, Robin? Yeah. yeah. I think we, we just need to try and go for things. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I, if I just take Chair's privilege for, for a moment, I mean, the, the, the examples of innovation have been extraordinary. And I think to Vivian's point about previous perceptions, perhaps that wasn't necessarily how we were perceived, not because we weren't innovating, uh, but perhaps we didn't always tell our story, it wasn't as visible. Um, but this extraordinary ability, um, you know, at, at some cost, because it's been exhausting, uh, to kind of reinvent, you know, the, a huge question for me is, how do we keep taking that forward? Um, I think I've got two participants hands up, uh, which I think must be Michelle's next, so forgive me, Michelle, to you. <laughs> Thanks, Jess. I was just going to build on that around the, the risk question that Robin posed. And I, I think what the, the approach that we've taken is about being risk aware, but not being risk averse. So actually understanding what the risks are, but then actually being really, really quite pragmatic about what we can do and just getting on with it. And if it fails, making sure we've set the culture that staff know it's OK if it doesn't work and that we haven't put massive investment into it. So actually, it's not going to cost us much. So I thought I'd just give a couple of examples of very little things that we've done, because I think sometimes it's helpful. So, so one of the things that we did was we created we knew a lot of students couldn't return um, to the library physically, either because of where they were based at the moment or because of um, health etc so we we set up a library home from home so what one of my members of staff did he filmed himself in the library over a two-hour period just working away sounds of the library behind him and we just posted that as something that uh, students could download and they could have that alongside them while they were working at home and we just thought oh this is a you know it's a bit of a gimmick we'll see what happens 
students loved it and went absolutely crazy like the feedback was just amazing um so you know really really minor but but actually little things like that I think get people really excited and that was what maybe a few hours of someone's time to record themselves I mean he was working <laughs> as well when he did it um so that was a really nice one and then um and then I think alongside that experimentation piece um Oh, sorry, no. What I was going to actually come back to was something that John raised around space and people coming back in to the library, so our staff, and would it be equitable and things. And I think we need to think carefully about what we mean by that. Um, so um, I think the pandemic in general, all the research shows that the people that it's hit hardest are women and particularly working mothers. Um, and I feel quite strongly about this as a working mum, obviously. Um, and, I, and I think those people that are making decisions about how we're gonna go back on uh, to our campuses, which aren't always ourselves in libraries, it's you know the, the university more generally. I think we need to be really careful about who who's in the room making those decisions and making sure where we can influence that we do influence. So there was a really good um, article on um, Dropbox. I'll, I'll post it in the chat when I find it after about um, virtual first. And I think it's really thinking about why do you need people back in to start with? What activities will they do while they're on site? Um, and what can be done at home and, and Dropbox, their approach was that actually lots of stuff can be still done asynchronously, doesn't need um, you to be on site, but but those activities that do, and maybe that's in the afternoons or maybe that's on set days, but really just taking a very different approach and forgetting, uh, moving away from this idea of presenteeism um, and things like that. So I think that would be um, a really powerful thing for all of us to think about with our own staffing as well. There's loads of nods um, and some brilliant comments in chat. Um, uh, I've got uh, Diane Job who's just come into uh, the meeting and then I think Masood has also put his hand up. So Diane, do you want to just introduce yourself? And um, you were raising some comments in chat about leadership and, and I think that question about wherefore with leadership, what has it changed? What, what, you know, what, what are the qualities? The floor's with you, Diane. Well, thank you. Uh, I'm Diane Job. I'm Director of Library Services at the University of Birmingham. And, and my thought started after when I was listening to John speak um, and talking about emerging leaders um, and, 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 and also the kind of connection to the well-being piece. Um, and, and I started this thought train thought yesterday as well. About, it's about what is not just the nature of leadership, but the nature of followership. followership. And I think at a societal level, we've, also, we've been asking ourselves the que our questions, who are we prepared to follow on what basis? Um, and, and I think... The, the when you know very early on in the pandemic I, I think we probably all wish we'd lived in New Zealand um at one point um and but 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 the actions and behaviors of our leaders um and and the kinds of things that we value about those things I think we've we've had time to reflect on in a way perhaps we haven't before and also personally for me as as the leader of my service I've, I've been thinking about have I exhi exhibited the kind of leadership qualities that those people um, would should have expected of me and, and would have hoped from me. And I think it does change the nature of that relationship with the team, particularly as we go back into a more kind of hybrid way of working. Um, and it fundamentally comes down to what what are the things that we value uh, and are we, are we displaying that? Um, so, so I think there are some big questions in us because we are not going to back back to what we had before. Um, it's it's new for us all. Uh, uh, fantastic, Diana, and, and uh, that kind of sense. However, we frame the future beyond the pandemic, you know, the new normal, we are changed, and you know, the the the, the adaptation uh, from that um, we are still working through, but th 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 there isn't a return. It, we are changed. Um, um, delighted that Masood Koka, uh, incoming uh, director of University Libraries at, at Leeds, has joined us and also the vice chair of our UK. So welcome, Masood. Um, I'm going to ask if anyone else would like to come in on that question of leadership. I think it's a really rich one. Um, if anyone's got any hands they want to put up or make comments on this point. Okay, not at the moment. So let me see if there is, um, we talked a little bit about that kind of question of um, equity 
and also of hybrid. And it seems to me there's a quite a big challenge for those of us leading libraries at the moment, you know, what are we going to stop doing <laughs> in order to do the new things that have come in? And also, it, you know, ensure that we build those inclusively. If anyone's got a magic bullet for this, I'd love to hear it. But it seems to be a kind of central question. We can't keep doing it all. Masood. Thank you, Jess, and uh, an absolute pleasure seeing you all again as well. Thank you. Um, just wanted to add a couple of thoughts on, uh, instead of all thinking about what can we stop doing, I think we also need to add what can we do differently? And that's one big learning for me through, through the whole pandemic as well. And goes back to, I think the point Robin, you were raising about risk. And there's a way, I think part of me thinks that we need to change our mind um, set on this and actually move away from what do we need to stop doing or where is the biggest risk to where's the biggest value and how do we collaborate in different ways to achieve that. And I think there is a, something to say about the mindset that's come through this, uh, this uh, pandemic. And I think Michelle was referring to this as well when she was saying, let's look at pragmatic solutions rather than we are under a lot of pressure and we just have to do something about it. And one thing that I'm particularly interested in is we are a global world who's come close even further because of this. We are all here digitally in a way that we might not have been able to in the past. What are some of the unique opportunities we can do that? What are some of the collaborations we can do that? What are some of those quick and dirty outcomes which leads and moves us forward in some ways that we can do that? And we don't have to do it in the UK anymore. We don't have to do it in the Europe anymore. We, we don't have to do it in Australia anymore. We can actually pick our partners and say, this hybrid working pattern allows us to do that. So let's see what we can do differently Let's build on that power of collaboration and therefore look at where the highest level of value is delivered to ourselves, to the sector and to the institutions that we are part of. That's just some food for thought there. That's wonderful, Masood, thank you. And actually a perfect cue into our third thematic area, which is about engagement. And we can really take this in any way that we want to, because I think we've got some strands here. We, we talk about engagement with the communities we serve, uh, engagement with our, our staff as group, and also engagement with, with each other as, as member organizations. So I'm gonna kind of pose a question really, um, uh, building on the experience this time, building on uh, both its, its, its challenging legacies and also the opportunities that are ahead. How can we, how might we work together as a community uh, to build on the shared experience um, and think about collective benefit that comes out of this, um, whether that's between institutions or between associations. Um, and I just happen to know that Vivian uh, has agreed to just kind of uh, give us a head start on this one. So Vivian, can I come to you first and then we'll, we'll bring others in? Sure. I'm sure. Can I, can I start by thanking Masood for just setting the conversation up so beautifully? Um, because I, I think there is an opportunity to focus on collaborations and identifying new value. Uh, and it's it's not an easy it isn't an easy task. Nothing in this pandemic has has really been easy. And you know, I, when I reflected on it at first, you could imagine a few very practical and simple and logical things that that we could do, uh, and they would certainly um, help uh, advance us. Um, you know, things for example, you know, our health experts have indicated that we're fooling ourselves if we think that there won't be some other kind of health emergency coming you know we're going to get past this but 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 this is but this is um a reality and so, and honestly we need to be better prepared uh for the next one and so I, I think of some of our health sciences libraries that that were really ahead of the pack on this because in some cases they already had emergency um preparedness plans in place and they were able to pull those plans out and to use them when the rest of us were, were imagining where we could best start. So I, I would love to see us sharing some of our protocols and, and some of our metrics across our, our um, geographic areas. I think that's uh, very practical and, and quite easy to do. And I, I think we could also document our experiences and best practices in the collective. You know, what, what has worked and, and what hasn't. We've heard some of these stories already today. And, and what evidence actually proved value when we were making our decisions and which evidence proved to not actually be helpful. You know, there's 
and there's ex an extraordinary corpus of information and uh, data that could be used for some international research studies uh, on our response. But when I'm thinking bigger about this, um, I would really love to see us work together to really reimagine our professional narrative. You know, I've been captivated, um, as I'm sure many of you have been, by RLUK's notion of the digital shift. And it's a notion that I will say came to me at the exact right time. And I believe that the pandemic actually forced us to accelerate the pace of the shift. Uh, and it moved us in directions that we were already going. We were heading in these directions anyway, but it forced us um, to actually accelerate the pace and move faster than any of us ever dreamed possible. I would also love us to, to look at competencies, um, you know, from an international perspective. And so what are the skill sets that are required to be successful in a 21st century research library, regardless of what part of the world you are in? And I, you know, I think about which of these skills are actually transferable. And I think of this in part because of work that Carl is doing here in Canada around competencies. I know that Carl has been active in the competency um, work as well. And so could we bring this work together and examine what it tells us about the future of work. And finally, um, I would love us to continue doing what we're doing today. And that is really convening international groups to discuss the issues of common concern. And as I think Masid said a few minutes ago, the internet has made this a much uh, smaller world. And I actually believe that IARLA is an excellent convening body and each one of our organizations can be an excellent convening body to bring together all of this great uh, work. So I'm gonna stop right now um, and just open it up to the rest of my table companions. Thank you so much, Vivian. John's got his hand, I'm going to come to him, but can I just give a big uh, welcome to Josh Sendall from the University of Lancaster who's joined the table. And Josh, please do just raise your hand if you want to come into the conversation, it'd be great. Uh, John. So I'm going to start by saying here, here to Vivian <clears throat> on these international collaborations. Uh, I, this is just, you know, really wonderful to, to have the opportunity to, um, to, to talk and, and explore our, our collective experiences uh, around the pandemic and to think about new ways of working together. I, it's just uh, really um, uh, enlightening and encouraging, I think, for the future, I would say. So I'm gonna, I, I wanna just say a couple of things about the collective collection, which is a word that Robin used early on uh, around the table. And uh, so, so first, I, I wonder if, how the pandemic is going to affect our open futures. And, you know, I, I think it's maybe no surprise that, that this week, all of a sudden, the uh, University of California system announced that they have a deal with Elsevier for a transform, transformational agreement. And, uh, you know, how are we going to see things like that uh, shift to, to other places uh, around the world as a result of the pandemic and this call for for research to be open. Um, now our health sciences library here at Iowa, we never, we never stopped in our library loan during the pandemic. And at one point uh, in the depths of this last spring, I think we were one of four academic medical libraries uh, in the United States that was still delivering articles. And you know, the research on, on coronavirus really went back to SARS and relied on a lot of old information. So our librarians were pulling from print journals and scanning. So I think there's just so much to do here, which, which takes me to another collaboration that, that I can't help but, but uh, mention for a subset of ARL libraries, which is, are the libraries of the Big Ten Academic Alliance. And uh, the libraries of the Big Ten are working on a concept called the Big Collection. And I'll paste a link here in the chat but we have committed across the 15 members of the Big Ten Academic Alliance to start building something called the Big Collection or a shared collect collective collection so that researchers at the University of Iowa no longer just think they have access to Iowa's collection, but the entire collection of the Big Ten, where, where we have 22% uh, of the print resources in the United States are in our 15 libraries. 
And how can we take that print world and transition that to the electronic world? So it's this change of mindset and it's, it's a new center of gravity for how we negotiate licenses, how we work together. And uh, like Vivian said about the, the digital shift, this came at the exact right time. And we had been talking about this move to the big collection. And I think the pandemic and our experiences are gonna be the juice that we need to make it happen. There were amazing provocations coming through this. I'm loving, you know, the sense that whatever comes next, or in, indeed now we're more digital than before, that we are being bolder about being more open than before. Uh, and, you know, the ability to think above our physical spaces uh, in a bolder way than we've ever done before. All themes that Research Libraries UK and Research Libraries across the world have thought about. Uh, I'm going to bring in our colleague, Josh Schendel here. And Josh, if you want to introduce yourself and pick up on, on, on one of the themes, that'd be great. Of course, thank you, Jess. Uh, so I'm Josh Sendall, Research and Scholarly Communications Manager at Lancaster University. And I've really enjoyed um, listening to this conversation and also those reflections. And what struck me during this discussion is something thematic I've been thinking about. And that is the extent to which in, in the pre-COVID world, we discuss the way in which we, we exist and operate in a VUCA environment amidst, you know, volatility, uncertainty, complexity and ambiguity. And if that were true then, then we've certainly been living within, you know, a hyper VUCA environment. I'm always taken by the idea that when you're faced with a VUCA environment, the volatility, the uncertainty, the complexity, the ambiguity yields to vision and unity and clarity and agility. And I think we've seen that in droves within our academic libraries and within our communities. And at Lancaster, as part of the library management team, we've certainly done our level-headed best to provide unity and to provide clarity, absolutely. And that aligns, I think, you know, with what Liz had to say around providing clarity for our institutions, um, you know, that dependable sense of something about the old way of life that we knew and loved, our libraries at the heart of our institutions, they're still here for us. They're still providing services for us. We're still accessing resources and collections. But I was really taken, I think perhaps it was Vivian who um, touched on librarians having superpowers. Um, and I think one of the other themes of the pandemic has been the extent to which we have recognized significant social, economic and health inequalities. And I have another provocation almost following on from John, and that is what role can we as research libraries play um, to address some of those inequalities? And I'm thinking here around the profession as a whole and our strong values, especially thinking here about social justice, um, but also the role that open research can play. Um, so a provocation there um, for anybody to, to pick up on and respond to. I, I think that's a great provocation, John, and, and we've definitely got time to explore it a little. It's come up through each section, that kind of question of equity, social justice that, you, you know, that you're framing. Uh, and I'm so pleased that, that John and yourself also kind of picked up the place of open in this, uh, you know, as one tool um, in, in our uh, in our, in our uh, continued framings, but perhaps accelerated framings. Um, that question of social justice and inequity, would anyone like to come in on that? Because this is where our different international positions may give us some different perspectives, which could be really valuable. Uh, Astrid. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> what we've noticed in, in, in among our members across Europe is that besides the, dig the digital shift, there's also a digital divide. <laughs> So there, there are um, lots of countries, Southern, Southern and Eastern Europe, where there, there is a lack of uh, simple laptops, infrastructure, and uh, uh, students don't have access to all that digital material that, that libraries are making available. So uh, that was a point of, of interest. Uh, uh, not that I have a solution, but, but uh, it was a, a very clear outcome of the survey we did. Astrid, that's really helpful. 
there's a great question uh, that kind of picks up on some of these issues, but turns it to a different lens in the chat. And that relates to issues of, of um, equity, diversity, inclusion, less about services, but more about recruitment and who we are and who we want to be. Uh, and I think I'm just going to ask the question openly. It looks like Dan's going to put her hand up, which is great. Uh, how has the pandemic influenced your recruitment and the roles you're recruiting to? The approach, focus on diversity and equity. I'm going to come to Diane and then to Robin. I think that's a really, really good question. And, and I think as all of us sit here and can think about what does the return look like in the next couple of months? Those are those are the exact questions that we're kind of asking ourselves. Are we going to are we going to challenge ourselves to be thinking about the kinds of people that um, that we want to recruit and, and what they can do? And, and I think their expectations will be changed. Their expectations about um, the flexibility that we can offer, um, the the development opportunities that we can um, that we can give, and it's I think it will be a real challenge. But it but it just feels like a huge opportunity to 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 be really really forward thinking about this. Um, you know, j just something as simple as we operate a twenty four seven building, but we recruit people to a nine to five it's nonsensical um, and we have shown that that actually if we if we've got really good policy around what people are doing really good procedures really good management structures really good skill sets in our in our managers across our teams that actually we can be really really flexible and I think that will then lead ultimately to that kind of that diversity in thinking in what our workforce looks like. Um, and when you get that, then you get the kind of, uh, the, 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 we talk a lot in Birmingham about the buzz, but the buzz comes when people feel that they can, they can shine in that kind of environment. So I think there's a huge uh, opportunity. And, and, and there's been on the chat in, in various ones of our, of our kind of lists about what are those policies that are on the verge of being issued looking like what are they saying and we have a big role to play in shaping those right now because we have been the ones who've lived this from the start we were the ones first back aside from security services in, but in terms of service that was that was us across collectively so so i think there's an awful lot there that we can lead on that we can influence um, in the way the organization behaves differently Thank you so much, um, Diane, uh, and you know, a comment from Kirsty in chat about the courage we need to do this. Um, and I think that is also where these networks come in, in stimulating the conversation, giving us our strength uh, and ideas. So I love an open question that's led to four hands. This is fantastic from our, from our table. Um, I, the order I wrote them down in which they came up were Robin, Masood, uh, Vivian and Jill. If I've got that wrong, I apologize, but I'll come to Robin first and then Masood and go from there. Well, you're always right to come to me first, Jess. That's no problem. <laughs> Paying tribute to my elders, Robin. <laughs> yeah, very much so. So I, I, I'm struck by some of the comments. I'm just thinking to the services we all already provide, like Follow the Sun. We were thinking above, ab, ab, above even national boundaries in terms of uh, providing a service for a single institution, as it were. Uh, and I wonder how much more of that we can do. So we're one of the um, issues around inclusion and, and diversity has, for me, uh, has always been the fact if you bring people together, you actually cause problems by the virtue of differences. If people are actually working remotely and they don't have to travel, uh, either physically or in terms of cost, then you, you, you're going to be more inclusive and the risk possibly of um, uh, of creating issues by bringing people together might be overcome. If you're willing to take the risk, and part of the problem we have, I think, is we are so bound by physical space. It is so important to us. You know, that physical building, the library is so important. Yes, the digital is there as well, but we can't at this point, and we won't for a long time, or, or would we want to um, get away from the, the physical space? But it seems to me that we, we might have two different types of workforce. Uh, and certainly I've already talked to colleagues in IT services are, are thinking exactly this. Their, their issues around diversity and inclusion are much worse than ours. And they're seeing the, the, the ability to recruit someone from say London or whatever, who doesn't have to come to the Midlands, doesn't have to upstakes, doesn't have costs, et cetera. 
it would be so much better. So I'm thinking perhaps, as I say, we have two different types of organization, depending on role, et cetera. Yeah, I just did that, didn't I? I'm sorry. Uh, I, you know, I'm going to forget that. Let's come to Masood straight away, Masood. Thank you, Jess. Uh, one of the most um, uh, loved phrases of this year has been, or in fact, the whole pandemic has been, you're on mute. Um, I, I just wanted to pick up on something, and I think this is this goes beyond libraries and um, it goes to any organization, any entity particularly, which is in order for it to survive, it needs to innovate. And innovation depends on, um, particularly the innovation of the future depends on diversity. It's not even a question of it will benefit from, I think it depends on diversity now. And that diversity means having some difficult uh, discussions to begin with. It means having very difficult conversations. And um, I often quote Kwame Christian on this, who, who basically said, uh, the best things in life are on the other side of a difficult conversation. And that basically means having difficult conversations on what does it mean for us as, a, as an organization in terms of our workforce balance, both at gender level, at ethnicity level, at thinking level. Uh, but it also means how do we work collaboratively to balance some of those things and also think about innovation at the same time. And um, it's not going to be easy. And I would go as far as saying, and I know this is a difficult thing for a lot of us to hear, including myself, that while we absolutely believe in the principles, we don't fully live and breathe them yet. We, we haven't really pushed them in our lives in the way that we could. We haven't really made them our core part of values in the way that everyone uh, believes in them and everyone lives them. And I think for us, the principles are there implementation hasn't been as successful and it's that implementation that will require those difficult conversations that will require a, a level of acceptance and a level of um, vulnerability through us as leaders to have those things and move forward and i'm last thing i would say is that i'm absolutely in awe of what the american libraries are doing especially in terms of the recruitment practices and particularly particular positions dedicated to this work as well and I think we can all take some inspiration from that as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Masood. And I've, I've seen you uh, on your tweets before talking about the good stuff happening beyond the difficult conversations. And, I, and I'm really, really taken with that. I think it, it's absolutely essential. Uh, and, and there's something about these tremendously difficult times, which remember we've had to have the courage to have difficult conversations. We need to keep having them and see where that leads us. Uh, now, I've completely forgotten the order. So can I come I think to it's me. I think it's Vivian, me. And, go, I, and go. I will be very, very go. quick. And we've had lots of conversation about recruitment and, and how in some ways it's liberating to be able to recruit without these geographic boundaries and 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 we're all ready to 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 move into these high flex kind of organizations you know we're mentally preparing ourselves in a recent uh, conversation of the carl directors we were having a conversation about the other side of the coin which is the retention and the fact that it although it's easy to hire people how do you create a sense of engagement and, and cultural like inclusion so that they feel that they're truly part of that organization when they're being onboarded online and 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 so we're we're really struggling with that so we think there has to we have to find ways of, of doing not only the recruitment but how to really bring people in and make them feel part of our organizations and that it's not actually going to be easier uh, when we move to uh, more flexible work arrangements so i just i just wanted to put that on people's radar it's such an important point and i, I think we'll all have experience of, of people coming on board during this time and uh, sometimes even moving city during such a difficult time and then how do you meet people how do you become part of a community it's so hard Jill thanks Jess I, th I think the comment I was going to make was probably past us by but you know I, th I think this recruitment strategy relates very well to our associations as well you know our, our associations traditionally had a physical uh, office in our, in our capital city which isn't the best place to recruit the best minds for our association. Because of COVID, we're in our fully virtual office. Our staff are located across the country and, uh, you know, we've got the best and the brightest working within our association that call are a terrific national office. So I'm really pleased. But I did uh, just want to pick up on what Masood was talking about because um, the Australian Library and Information Association have just announced a really bold program 
to really change the way in which we recruit into the, the profession uh, with some new pathways for, for people to come in. You know, we're really struggling with some of our library schools and, and the numbers um, of students, both enrolling and uh, the number of degrees that we have. And they're really looking for new types of people and, uh, you know, with different types of backgrounds to really join our, our library community. So I think that that's going to be quite exciting work. It's only just kicked off, but you know, through traineeships and internships, uh, you know, really drawing people into the profession and offering them that professional pathway that might not be going to university and having a university degree. So I think it, it's quite an exciting piece of work. Thank you so much, Jill and Kirsty. Yes, I'm just going to pick up on that diversity issue because actually when we're talking around about physical, we've always been really clear around about accessibility and where the challenges were. But actually we've got these same challenges in the digital environment as well. They're just sometimes hidden or different. And again, that's going to bring... I need a real mind change. And again, we really need diverse teams, not just in skills and backgrounds, ethnicity and approach to really tackle that because digital is just as challenging as the physical. And we need to think around about how can we make that equitable? We're already aware of kind of digital poverty, but there are far more other challenges as well that we need to tackle and try and kind of bring into and work through collectively and and see how we can take that forward so that actually our physical or you know the library needs to be both a physical space but it needs to also be a digital space and I'd like one time to be at that point where when people say the word library they have some sort of hybrid of the two that springs to mind immediately and that's what our users are engaging with because then we'll know that we're really beginning to reach where we need to be for the new industrial revolutions that are coming Leslie, thank you so much for, for coming in and, and actually pivoting us back around to an area which Liz, uh, having come into the table, uh, has also introduced. And, and Liz, you, you posed a question which is about the interface between physical and digital. That might you might have moved on in way, what you want to bring in. So go where you like. But, you know, what do you want to add at this point? Thanks, Jess. I think I wanted to pose a question back to the panel as we kind of go into the last few minutes, really, which is how do we get to a situation where we do have that absolute blend of physical and digital? So, so what do we do next? Because we've lived in very much a virtual world for the past 12 months. We are going to move back onto campuses now in much more strength. And certainly, I, I feel from, from a Durham perspective, my staff are really tired of the digital. And there is that get back to campus, get back to normal again. So trying to hang on to what must be a good blend of physical and digital moving forward. Do the panelists have any ideas about how we achieve that? Uh, John. So I, I think I would start by saying that um, at least at my institution, and uh, again, this is gonna be more of a local comment than a broad comment, um, I, we're, we are um, expecting some guidance from the university uh, that will lead us through a process to really look at every position um, as folks come back and uh, look at the roles and responsibilities for each position and think about um, how can that work be accomplished best on campus or could it be accomplished remotely. So I think we will just, you know, make a very careful analysis. And we've already, we've got probably, I would say 10 to 15% of our employees are already back um, uh, on site full time. And then another 30% of our folks are in a hybrid uh, situation already where they're coming in on different shifts. So uh, as we bring everyone else back over the course of the next couple of months, I think um, we'll take advantage of advice from the university and just look closely at those roles and think then about how do we interface with activities on campus? You know, who's ready to continue with virtual versus in-person instruction? Uh, how best can we impact the research enterprise and so forth? So it'll be, uh, it'll be a one-by-one -one, uh, process for us at least to start. Thank you so much, John. And uh, uh, John, Josh has uh, put his hand up behind the scenes and then I'm gonna come to Kirsty. so Josh. I think absolutely building on what John said as far as possible, if as organisations we can take a person focused approach um, and have those conversations with our staff about what their preferences and to the extent that it's possible and we're able to 
um, enable service delivery to accommodate um, requests to, to work in a hybrid way or back on campus um, or remotely. And then just a bit of blue sky thinking here and, and perhaps I'm thinking more about how we deliver our services for students and what a hybrid blended physical digital environment might look like in the future. I think it's uh, it's almost, it seems a shame to me that conversations about virtual reality and augmented reality have kind of dropped off the radar a little bit um, in the HE space. And I think if we really wanna keep the best of digital um, and physical, um, and enable as far as it is possible, a seamless experience, um, even for example, for, for delegates at a conference, then are there opportunities to start having those blue sky conversations about AR and VR again? I really hope so. Thank you, Josh. And there's been some great talks on some of those topics at this conference as well, which I think has stimulated a lot of thinking. Kirsty, there may be aspects that you wanna pick up uh, as, as you come back in. Absolutely, because I think for me, we need to look at what's amazing about what we offer physically and then what's amazing about what we can offer digitally um, and then look at the best of both. And I think, as Josh was saying, there's some really interesting things around about the hybrid piece and how we can bring physical and digital together and make that work as something that is together. And I think for me, then we really need to look at that augmented reality or virtual reality piece. And I think it has been moving along. What's been fascinating is that virtual reality has really moved along a pace, but actually for a lot of our users, it's going to be when augmented reality sort of takes another shift, that that is the space that a lot of people will be more comfortable in. It will be a lot easier to use because you're not out with the physical space you're inhabiting in your body. And I think that has some really exciting opportunities. And I think we as libraries need to explore what some of our services start looking like that. We've really taken that forward massively as we've looked at virtual consultations, how we've used chat and how we've flipped a lot of services that we've only felt we could do do really well in person, but well, we've been delivering them in really hybrid and mixed ways. And I think we need to hope that our staff aren't so tired and exhausted. I think Liz made a really good point there. We need to sort of enthuse them about some of these new opportunities and get them to try and test them out and be experimental and have some fun with them. And again, you know, make sure that if we do that, then actually we'll have a sort of team of staff who are willing to experiment and try and innovate because they'll suddenly get that bug for, well, we tried that, that didn't work, but we refined it, this worked, here we go, this is amazing. And it's that little and often, it's, it's like a muscle, it's like public speaking, if you keep doing it, you'll get better at it. And that innovation and risk-taking is something we need to infuse our staff with and hope that that's maybe one of the mechanisms we overcome pandemic fatigue. Thank you. Um, I, we are getting towards the last straight. I'm going to bring Robin in for the final comment in that strand, and then I'm going to bring us together around where do we go next as Ayala to, to pick up on some of these strands. Just Robin. a very quick co comment on the virtual augmented reality. And so we just need to get meetings sorted. Trying to have people in a room and people remotely having a meeting is a nightmare. If we can get that sorted, that will go a long way. <laughs> uh, yeah, I agree, Robin. In terms of inclusivity, that is one experience we'd really like to get right. Um, we are within uh, a whisker of, of, of the time ending for this slot. And I feel like we've kind of packed a whole conference into nearly an hour and a half uh, with, with huge thanks to the participants. I'm hoping this chat will be saved because I think there's some good uh, angles there for multiple blogs and, and follow-ups as well. Um, uh, I'm not going to put anyone on the spot here, but I would particularly like to ask my colleagues from uh, um, our IALA group, um, if there are particular strands that come out of this that you would like to see us talking about as an international group together, um, because it, it's been a lively conversation. Anyone want to come in? Jill. Uh, look, I just thought Vivian's uh, suggestion of, you know, rewriting the, the narrative and, you know, we, I think we're all going to have that that same challenge, you know, what are our libraries uh, post-COVID and, uh, you know, what is our role going to be? I think I think we could really benefit from having that conversation um, with Nyala and, and doing some advocacy together around that. I think that's a really useful idea. 
I really like that too. And I think this has been tremendously stimulating um, with fantastic contributions. I'm seeing some nods to that. Let me just see if uh, Vivian, uh, Astrid or John, uh, or indeed Robin want to add anything as a closing, John. Yeah, I'll, I'll agree with that. And I, I, think, I think we have an opportunity here uh, to continue the conversation in a way that maybe we haven't thought of before. I mean, um, and to bring others in. I mean, this has this has worked, you know, really well. I think, and it would be it would be exciting to to see what what the conversation would be like uh, if we had broader audience participation from you know from the other parts of the world as well, uh, because it's been so rich today. Um, but just imagine if we had sort of doubled the audience and there were other perspectives coming in. Uh, you know, then I think. As Robin suggested, we've got the issue of in-person versus virtual, and then there's the whole business of time zones and how do we how do we come up with a reasonable time to have these conversations? And you know maybe we need to do a couple at different times of the day, uh, but I think there's a lot of opportunity ahead for very fruitful conversations that will lead to maybe very small collaborations. Uh, but those small collaborations will feed into the big ones. I'm really taken with that. Maybe it's not so much a long table, but it's a long festival with little events, uh, you know, popping up, uh, timing, a uh, time allowing, because I agree. The opportunity to hear uh, from people in different parts of the world again will, will re you know, will, will challenge the thinking of each of us in our different settings. We are pretty much there. Again, um, Vivian, Astrid, if there's anything you want to add at this point, you, you're welcome to do, but Vivian. I will just say that I think it's a great moment for cultural um, humility <clears throat> and the fact that we can learn so much from each other. Uh, and and, and I, I just, I will stop with that. Thank you so much, Astrid. I just want to say thank you <clears throat> for uh for being here and uh, for all the participants for their discussions. Let's do this weekly <laughs> or monthly. <laughs> Just not at four in the morning. Um, <laughs> I, I am um, going to give the last word to Robin, actually. He's been a tremendous chair this year and his commitment to IALA has been fantastic. So I'd like to say thank you in front of this community for his um, contribution to that. And Robin, if there's any last words you'd like to make to this group in terms of taking forward this conversation, um, is anything you'd like to say? Well, thanks, Jess. That was a bit of a surprise. But I, I think for me, uh, uh, IARLA has been and uh, is and will continue to be a hugely important initiative. And it's, uh, I think, Vivian's I'd suggestion is something that IARLA has to take forward. We've seen over the last year um, with re re retrench, rec recovery retreat and, so, and um, uh, other activities, that, that what we can do with IARLA in our, through our different associations is growing all the time. And uh, you, you know, we have a real opportunity here to, do, to take a global perspective as it were, um, on the problems and issues facing us and the opportunities. So I would thoroughly encourage IARLA to, you know, to, to, to do what we talked about is hang the risk, go for it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Robin. So we're going to close this session now. It's been great. It's our first experiment of a long table virtually. I think it's worked. I'd really like to say thank you to those uh, colleagues who came in to join the table. It's not an easy thing to do, but you've really made our conversation. So thank you so much for doing so. Um, we are back at uh, uh, 1500, three o'clock for the lightning talks, which are always a fantastic, lively and uh, kind of uh, fast paced way to finish a conference. So I'm really hoping as many of you do come back for that as possible uh, but it's time to go and put the kettle on uh, as we always do in the UK whatever is equivalent is where you, where you are um, enjoy a quick break come back and refresh so my thanks to everyone and goodbye